Hey guys, as a wushu kung fu specialist with three black belts to his name, voice actor Adam MacArthur is kicking butt and taking names. Best known as the voice of Marco Diaz on the hit Disney cartoon Star vs. the Forces of Evil, uh, Adam is also the voice of Yuji Itadori in the anime franchise Jujutsu Kaisen. Find out how Adam went from competing in martial arts tournaments to laying down his vocal chops in this week's episode. Alison's Wonderland. You're watching Alison's Wonderland, inside the world of animation and games. I'm your host, Alison Packard. Please welcome to the studio, Adam McCarthy. Hello, I'm so happy to be here. Hi, Adam, it's so good to see you, well, cheers. Uh, yeah, I wanna kick it off with a, a tea cheers. Oh. Sweet little yes. Alison Wonderland cups. It, it has so been, cute. it has been a while since I've seen you in the flesh. So long. Yeah. Like years. Years. Like, Literal years. Literally. Yeah. I mean. Not like, oh, it's been a couple of weeks. Because right. time in LA is sometimes is oh, its, its own forever. thing. Yeah, yeah. Blame no, it no. on pandemic. Yes. Yeah, yeah. You've been in this time warp. Uh-huh. Um, but you've been doing amazing things. You've been doing, you created this whole thing. It you is created a together. wonderland. It It is coming together slowly. Yeah. Yeah. Slowly with, with Mike Del Rey's awesome set here at Real Voice LA. and Real Wood LA. Real Wood. <laughs> This is, Real this is wood. a legitimate piece of, pieces of wood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Thanks. Yeah. For How's, so how has voice acting in uh, the global pandemic been treating you? I mean, gosh, how lucky are we that uh, in a time when like so much stuff was shut down? I mean, we had a few weeks of like slowness when yeah. people were just like, what the heck is going on? Mm -hmm. But uh, I mean, it was a very busy time. Yeah. 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 It was a really busy time. Thankfully, I already had sort of a home setup built and uh -huh. ready to go when things started. So I started getting calls right away. I did like a Disney pilot during that time because casting oh, was amazing. so limited. They just had, they just like needed some help. And um, that's kind of the birth of anime for me. It was during that time and stuff. So uh -huh. yeah, it was, it was good. Wow. Okay. So, so you're relatively new to the world of anime then. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yes. So my, like for context, my first yes. voiceover job was in 1998. Okay. <laughs> and my first animated voiceover job was in 2020. Wow. Are yeah. you an anime fan? I have been. So like OG, like yeah. Pokemon, Sailor Moon, Dragon Ball, like in the 90s. Yeah. And then I just didn't really. I, okay. I have to always qualify this because sure. people who are fans of anime and stuff like that will be like, what the heck? It's so good. Da, 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 da. I was competing so heavily in martial arts mm -hmm. from the time I was like 12 until I was like 22, 23 that I didn't know anything else existed yeah. outside of that. I was like, like when I got to college, people were like, hey, have you heard the new John Mayer or Jack Johnson CD? And I'm like, who are they? Like, I don't know. <laughs> like, what is that? I don't know what that is. Uh, so I didn't know like people cared Pop about music. music. Yeah, I'm like, I didn't know that people cared about this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so it really, like for me, anime, like becoming a fan of anime yeah. didn't really happen until like 2015, uh -huh. 2014 maybe. Um, with a show called My Hero Academia. Oh. You know it? Sure. Yeah. Um, and it's just, we had Kellen on this show. Oh, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Kellen's great. Uh, that show is just amazing. And actually, mm -hmm. like speaking of Kellen, uh, who voices Overhaul, he, uh, um, him, uh, Rico Fajardo, who voices Mirio, and um, Justin Briner, who voices Deku, those three guys, the culmination of season four of that show mm -hmm. was when I was like, what the heck? These guys are having so much fun. Yeah. I want to, I want to be a part of that. Like, I want to do that. And I don't know for me personally, I'm sure you can speak to this too. Like, I feel like when you watch something that you like, mm -hmm. you can tell when people are having fun mm -hmm. or like when it just feels like the cast loves each other and is like excited to do this thing together. Yeah. And uh, that's how I felt watching that. And this was post, this was like post star. So star ended in May of 2019 mm -hmm. And sorry, I'm like going all over the place. Oh, that's oh, okay. okay. Yeah, Star ended in May of 2019. And I was just like kind of taking a few months to just like, I don't know. Absorb. Absorb new content and see like what else was out there. Yeah. And then I was watching that episode of My Hero, this like culmination of their season. It was either season three or season four arc with uh, Kellen's character overhaul fighting Deku and Mirio. And I was like, I got to do this. And then I reached out to CESD, which is, you know, our yeah. agency. and. From there, like this whole thing just was born, which is crazy. So what was the first anime that you worked on as a voice actor? Jujutsu Kaisen. <gasps> yeah. Literally the very what? first thing I booked was the lead on Jujutsu Kaisen. 
I as mean, a yeah. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was crazy. You know, I mean, uh, certainly there's so much anime content coming out with all the various um, networks yeah. and streaming mm -hmm. services and yeah. country rule and everything. But to uh, land on a property that is so wildly successful, like Jujutsu Kansen, what did that feel like? It was, uh, well, I mean, look, <laughs> I've been doing this long enough to know that you don't ever like get too excited before you're like, yeah, cash and checks, mm -hmm. right? Not even that. Before, you just like you have an awareness, right? Yeah. Of what, of what, how it's received and all that stuff. Um, but the the kind of the beauty of anime is we sort of are the secondary market. Like we're getting it, we're not getting it first. So you do have like a little test ground of like uh. Japan and seeing like what's really popular over there. And I think when I first auditioned for Jujutsu Kaisen, there had already been three episodes out. And I had watched it like before I got my audition. And I was like, this is awesome. Like I already really like liked the show. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we get Japan as sort of this test market and there were like billboards plastered all over, like all over Tokyo in the subways. Um, I have a friend who is like a, like Uber anime nerd um, in like the best way. She's literally, she's literally a walking anime encyclopedia. Amazing. And so I, I always ask, like whenever I get something that I haven't heard of yet or whatever, I was like, Hey, you know, what do you think of this? What do you think of this? Or do you know about this? And I'll get the rundown and kind of the inside mm -hmm. scoop. Mm -hmm. And she was like, oh, yeah, you definitely need to, like, take your time with these auditions. Like, make sure you're sending in really good takes and, and whatnot because this is going to be, like, the big next-gen, sh like, show. Wow. So, and it's been crazy. It's been crazy. I mean, what a I've roller been, coaster. Huh? Yeah, I've been uh, hitting up the convention circuit, mm -hmm. conventions all over the States. And, uh, I mean, it's not getting less popular. How do fans react when they meet you at a convention? Oh, it's awesome. I mean, literally like, like the range of reactions, uh, is <laughs> hilarious and, uh, also like super sweet and charming and endearing and everything. Um, you know, uh, it, it'll be like the people who are like, you know, super cool about it. Like, cool. What's up, man? You know, yeah. I really enjoyed your performance. You know, <laughs> there's the people who can't formulate a sentence. There's the people who cry. There's the people who just laugh. <laughs> there's the people who like hide behind their mom and their mom has to be like, oh, they're really shy. They've never, this is their first convention, you know? He's 47, but yeah, yeah. he'll get out there it's one day. still his first convention. <laughs> um, but no, it's, yeah, literally like any kind of reaction you could think of. Except, wow. you know, no one's like mad I'm there, which is cool. It's nice to have a job where no one's like mad that you showed up. Yeah. You know? It's, it's nice to be sort of the best part of somebody's week or month yes. or... Yes. Year. <laughs> yeah. It, it would be a completely different convention dynamic if people were like angry that I got, I, I was there, you know? Yeah. You're yeah. lucky you're not serving the hot dog that they had to wait 35 minutes oh, for. Oh, sweet people. Life. Bless their hearts. Yes. You know what? Everybody's job is important. Everybody's yes. job is important and some people the way, don't get enough credit. So tip your hot dog guy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love cheersing as many times as possible. By I way. love cheersing as many times as possible with like a totally, you know, beverage like tea. How, have you had this uh, <laughs> tea set for a very long time? I got it from Disneyland. It's so cute. Yeah. It's um, it's really Alice like in Wonderland it. theme. Yeah, really like it. There she is. Yeah, there she is. There's the girl. There's my girl. Um, wow. So, yeah. So now you are. And where are you guys at in the process of recording? Uh, so season one ended in May of 2021. Mm -hmm. um, we just had a movie come out that was a prequel to the series. So I actually wasn't in it. My character wasn't in it. Um, I know it was, you know, the movie's still good. You should see it. Uh, <laughs> no, the movie's amazing. The movie has smashed all these records in Japan. Amazing. It is like in the top 10 of highest grossing movies of all time in Japan. Um, it came over here. It totally slayed. Obviously, they're showing the Japanese version and the English version. So it's like, you know, a combo of all of that mm -hmm, stuff. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, so uh, season two has been announced. It's going to be sometime in 2023, which is like the hugest time span. It's like nothing specific. People always ask me at my tables, you know, they are, yeah. they're always trying to get the inside scoop at the conventions. Yeah. Like, so when did season two come out? And I'm like, now is the, is the J and um, the Japan, that's what they sometimes say, right? In yeah, the J, yeah, I'm like, yeah, 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 when you're J. recording, they'll be like, in the J, it's yeah. this, um, is the Japanese season two, has that launched no, yet? not okay. yet. Because that's yet. the thing, I, I mean, that maybe some people don't realize is that once the Japanese is out, it's pretty quick from dub to, it can be pretty quick from the dub to yeah. the air. Yeah, it, it'll be interesting. So lots has changed in this like anime world mm -hmm. since 2020 and since Jujutsu Kaisen has come out. Um, Crunchyroll and Funimation are now one studio. Yeah. 
Um, so it'll be interesting to see what, what kind of uh, treatment Jujutsu Kaisen gets um, now that they're combined. Because we were we started with Crunchyroll. Yeah. But Funimation is sort of like known for doing simul dubs, which is like My Hero mm -hmm, Academia, mm -hmm. where uh, the Japanese version and the English version are released yeah. here on the same day. Um, it would be really cool if we could get that and do that. I think, uh, I don't know, you know, when you have to wait a couple of weeks when you're, uh, uh, when you watch dubs versus subs, it can like hinder the momentum a little bit or yeah. people like, you know, people get antsy. So they're like, oh, I just want to know what happens. So Fine, just I will just watch, watch yeah, the yeah. sub. <laughs> but it's been cool with Jujutsu Kaisen because, uh, you know, we, we're on HBO Max. So we're not just on Crunchyroll. We've been on HBO Max, which I think has gotten... A lot of extra eyes on the show. Oh yeah, um, and it's like you know, amazing front page under anime and stuff. So it's that's been, great. It's been very cool. The, right, the the masses can also digest it versus yes. needing a subscription to totally. Crunchyroll. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so, um, would you have any conventions coming up that you'd like to shout out? Oh yeah, uh, in the next I've few got weeks? Acon. Coming, Acon. it's in Dallas, uh, mm -hmm. June 3rd through the 6th, I think is the dates. Great. This will um, air before that. Huh? This will air before that. Okay, sweet. Yeah. Um, and then what else is coming? Honestly, there's so I'm many. to check your calendar. There's so many. We can always, yeah. Yeah. I'm doing Anime NYC this year. Wow. I'm getting to go to New York. I'm very excited about that. That is amazing. Yeah. Wow. What yeah. a ride. I mean, I well, but in, to... To backtrack a little bit, yeah. now you're no stranger to wildly popular cartoons because also Star versus the Forces of Evil had an incredible fan base. Yeah. Um, so can we take it back even now to a time before Star yeah. and um, kind of uh, what your career was like even predating that cool. show? Yeah. So like I said, my very first voiceover job was in 1998. Yeah. Um, it was a... A series of Macy's radio commercials. <laughs> um, so basically, like, I had always begged my parents to get me or to let me do acting classes. And they said no for a very long time. And then I just kept asking. And so for my, it was either my 16th birthday or I was 16 and it was like Christmas or something. Um, they gifted me a four week class at this place called Kids on Camera. Uh -huh. In San Francisco, that's where I grew up. Um, we'll insert the footage here if we can find it. Oh my gosh, that'd be amazing! <laughs> just put a little a little shout out for kids. We on had camera. Jessica DeChico on, and she, her, and I both flashed back to some footage of us in like elementary school. That's it's pretty amazing. Funny. So you that's let, amazing. You okay, should, you let me know if you okay. can check. Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll take a look. <laughs> um, so yeah, just started taking acting classes, and this place kind of covered everything. Um, mm -hmm. It wasn't just like a voiceover place; they kind of covered all a bunch of on camera commercials and whatnot. And uh, the owner of the school used to be a voice on Sesame Street. Wow. And That's so, huge. yeah, the the local talent agents knew that she like had, you know, people coming in for classes and stuff. So she would, they would send her auditions. So they just needed some teen boy voices yeah. and I ended up like getting that. So that's almost exactly my story, which really? I was taking classes at CP Casting in Boston, which okay. for on camera stuff. And they were looking for e learning for mm -hmm. Prentice Hall, yeah. a young teen voice. And yeah. just went in and booked it. And that's it was amazing. like an eight month thing. That's amazing. We have very similar stories. Yeah. <laughs> um, it, e learning was also very popular in San Francisco. One of the like big, like first big non commercial things I did was uh, for this company called Global English. Oh, yeah. And they taught kids in other countries how to speak English. Oh, amazing. Via CD ROMs, <laughs> which is a little CD disc that you put in your computer, everybody. For those that don't know, cheers. Cheers. It kind of looks CD like ROMs. this. Yeah. But yeah. with a hole in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yep. And you, and you put, put it, it in your computer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Amazing. Um, Retro. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So I wonder, I probably have that CD-ROM somewhere. Maybe we could flash back to that footage. Yeah. I'd have to buy it, go like to the Goodwill and get and a computer. <laughs> I can actually play a CD-ROM because I don't think any computer I have now takes a CD. Oh, wow, uh, that's amazing. Yeah. So I basically like, I mean, I can, I can take you through like through the years, but I won't do that. We'll, we'll like go a little, we'll like yeah. fast forward a little bit. Um, just started auditioning and stuff. I did like some independent movies up in San Francisco. Uh -huh. I did a lot of on-camera stuff, but voiceover was kind of always sprinkled in there. But ever since I was a kid, like I've loved cartoons. I always wanted to do cartoons. It was definitely like where I wanted to end yeah. up. Um, I moved to LA in 2003. Mm -hmm. And for school, I wanted mm -hmm. to, I did junior college in Northern California, transferred to a school down here in Southern California, 
uh, finished up my last two years, but got an agent like basically right when I got here. Mm -hmm. Um, I found a lot of success really early on, on camera commercials. Mm. It was like back when they were still pretty good and like paying really good and stuff. Were you at CSD? No, I was with, oh gosh, who was my first agent? DDO, artist agency, I think. Yeah. Um, and we just like crushed the commercials. Um, I think I signed with them and like a week later, I booked a commercial a week for like three weeks in a row. What? And then like a, the next month, like booked Magic. one or two commercials. Yeah, it was, it was wild. Um, but also as a, like a young, like early twenties person, mm-hmm. I was like, I always knew that this was going to happen. <laughs> like, this is how it was supposed to be. I knew once I got to LA, like instant success, you know, and I was like making money from these commercials and stuff like that. And uh, I'm actually really glad that I had that experience early on uh, having like a decent amount of success because in like 2007, 2008, mm-hmm. when that was like an economy the writer's crash, stra- there was a, strike yeah, there was and- a writer strike, the economy crashed. Mm-hmm. Everything basically was bad. Um, I wasn't getting anything. I wasn't mm. booking any work. And it was a, uh, yeah. it was one of those like, oh, I should have like been saving my money instead of, and I wasn't, I mean, I don't, I didn't spend my money on bad things or anything like that. Rent and but, yeah, food. But and... it was like, I didn't get another job. Right. You know, and I yeah. very much like could have gone and like waited tables or mm-hmm. whatever. Um I had a manager at the time who like really looked down on that. And I kind of just listened and was like, yeah, if you're not only acting, you're you're not really giving it your all. And of course, there's something to be said about that. And there's also something to be said about keeping yourself afloat so you can survive. I mean, I think a lot of people don't realize that that's actual the more realistic story of the picture is your success, even though you're trotting along, hopefully upward there's so many peaks and valleys in between yeah totally and and for me it was a really good learning time Mm -hmm. um i started a business uh a photo booth rental company i started a photo booth rental company like shortly after that um because i was just thinking during that time i'm like this whole idea of like the starving artist Mm -hmm. and all this stuff i'm like i just don't want to subscribe to that no yeah I don't know. The thriving artist. Yeah, Yeah. the thriving. Mm -hmm. Like, there's no reason you can't be an artist and, like, go out to dinner when you want. Or, like, afford groceries (laughs) or rent, you know? Um, And, yes, you know, budgeting maybe isn't something we're always taught in school and is so important. But but being able to invest in your career, you know, sometimes you do. You will need a survival job to be able to afford the acting classes and yeah. Yeah, I I always tell people, a lot of people at my tables at conventions and stuff, they're like, well, what's your advice? And I'm like, there's no shame in doing what you have to do in order to do what you love to do. Yeah. Meaning like, if you have to go get that job, I've always had like this, this one manager traumatized me that I had really early on in my career. He's like, never leave town. Don't do anything (sighs) else. And I listened and I like, I like lost myself in that. Uh I truly lost myself in that. Um, I stopped doing martial arts, which was like (sighs) weird during that time and uh because i was like yeah if i'm doing that i'm not working towards my acting career but you really have to like do the things that make you you so that when you get an opportunity to be an actor or like you know work on a job you are bringing something to the table otherwise you're just this like shell acting like a human being you know a hundred percent yeah i feel that that's not something that you get as a young person hopefully you have mentors to guide you in that way. Yeah. But we are, we come into this with such a driver. Those of us that are ambitious mm-hmm. um, are willing to mold ourselves to be an totally. actor. And what they're looking for is you. Yeah. Yeah. And I never knew what that meant mm-hmm. until like, you know, going through that sort of like time when I wasn't working, I'm like reassessing everything that happened and all that stuff. So, yeah. So I started my business in like 2011. It really got going in 2012. And then 2013 is when I booked Star. Wow. So what was the audition process like for Star versus the first is of evil? It was like any other audition, Uh which is the most boring answer ever. (laughs) I mean, it literally kind of came through. Actually, so the interesting thing about it is before. So, you know, I was the voice of Marco Diaz. Uh, In development, Marco had a different name. His name was Sol, S-O-L, like Mm -hmm. son. And the auditions originally came through with the same kind of artwork, like the character looked the same, but his name was Soul. And then we, I had my audition, did that audition. And I remember like, I didn't, I mean, I didn't hear anything back for that. 
And then I think it was like maybe six, seven months later, an audition came through for Marco Diaz and it said Marco Diaz. And I, I recognized the, the character and I was like, I feel like I've auditioned for this before. Uh -huh. Look back through my archives. I was like, oh, I have. Oh, that's weird. They changed the name. Oh, okay. Whatever. Like, you know, that happens. And uh, I don't know. I just did the audition. I just did the audition. Um, this was during a time like I had just uh, not too long prior had worked on Star Wars The Clone Wars, which was on Cartoon Network. Mm -hmm. And Disney brought me in. Disney had now purchased Star Wars when I was auditioning for Star Wars The Forces of Evil. And I had a callback for Marco and I had a callback for Ezra Bridger on Rebels, Star Wars Rebels, uh -huh. at, which was also Disney at the exact same time. And I was, again, trying not to count my chickens before they were hatched, mm -hmm. but I felt like, and this could be very wrong. This might not have been what was happening at all. It's totally coincidence, but I just felt like they were trying to find something for me mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. And so they had called me back for a couple of different things. I read for Ezra, obviously didn't get that, but I got Marco. Got Marco. And the, wow. yeah, the callback process was maybe like three, three callbacks or so. That's a good amount. For that project. Yeah. Um, my last one was with Eden Shear, who voiced Star on the show. And that was just like a surreal experience. Um, was it magic? What made it surreal? It was like, well, this actually happened a few times in the recording over the life of Star. But like, I mean... I don't want to say like, I'm just a voiceover guy, but like we're in there with people who are like leads on network, on camera sitcoms, uh -huh. like things like that. Yeah. So Eden had been working on the middle on ABC for like many, many seasons. And I walked in and in my mind, I am like having an expectation of that person, what that person is going to do or what their abilities are or what, but more so like their emotions mm -hmm. in those moments. And I walked in and Eden was like, oh, this is my first time. She like grabbed my arm. She's like, this is my first time doing any voiceover. I'm so nervous. And that was just like a, a moment for me where I was like, oh, she's nervous. We're all just like here together, like trying our best, you know? And it just, yeah. I, I said, you don't have to be nervous. You're going to be amazing. I said, I'll do whatever I can to help you look amazing. Because that's like an improv thing, right? Yeah. You make, if you make your, the people on stage with you look good, then you're going to look good. And you don't do it because it's going to make you look good. It's just like, it's for the betterment of the whole project. And we just, I don't know, did our thing. And it was a lot of fun. And we laughed a lot. And Eden gets very gassy in the booth. And that added a whole <laughs> element of fun uh, to everything. Um, yeah, it was just like a really cool, a really cool experience. And uh, one of the few times we got to record together mm -hmm. uh, for the life of the series. Oh, really? Yeah. So mostly you were... If they bring you guys in separately? Solo. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Most of the people that I met, like the famous guest stars on that show, um, were people who were like coming out of their session as I was going in or something wow. like that. Wow. Or like on panels at Comic-Con and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. Like, hi. Yeah. Hey, I'm Mark. My yeah. <laughs> My name's Adam. <laughs> yeah. Alan Tudyk. I got to meet Alan Tudyk, who was super nice. But yeah, he was like, I, I was like, hey, uh, Alan? And he, he like looked at me like, what the heck? This was like out, like not even in context. I was like, I voice Marco on Star. And he was like, oh, hey. And he like gave me a hug and stuff. It was pretty cool. Oh. Yeah. Now I've heard that um, Marco Diaz was actually based on the creator Darren Nevsky's husband. Had you heard that? Um, I don't know. But Have I you was, met him before? I've met Bobby. Bobby <laughs> is amazing. Bobby's an amazing director. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He's, he's done a lot of like, um, they're just like a talented power couple mm -hmm. basically. Um, yeah. Bobby's awesome. Was, was Marco based on Bobby? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how Darren it's could not baby. take qualities that Bobby had and put them into, you know, characters like Marco. Uh -huh. I'm going to say yes. I'm huh. going to say yes. I've heard that. And <laughs> that is very true. Has <laughs> Now, do you feel that after you had met Bobby that it did that influence? Had you already been doing Marco or? Gotcha. Yeah, I think I think we had already been in production for mm -hmm. a bit um, by the time that I met Bobby. Um yeah, so I wouldn't say that it necessarily, like, influenced anything that I was doing. Like, I didn't change, like, any character traits or, like, you know, speaking cadences or anything to, like, match Bobby's <laughs> or anything like that. This is hilarious. By character the way. I'm going to call acting, one of them and be like, put, dude. Put on his clothes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> start wearing his cologne. Yeah, yeah. And just seeing yeah. He does have, a, he has, like, a nice little beard, too. Maybe a... Maybe I, it did rub off. Yeah, yeah, maybe, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, so did you anticipate, you know, did they have any idea that Star would be such 
a beloved property? I don't think so. I mean, like we were talking about earlier with anime stuff. I mean, with with Western animation or stuff that's done here, like you just don't know until it's out. Um, they did preview. I think it was maybe the intro to Star or like a small clip from Star at a panel Comic-Con, at San Diego right? Comic-Con. I think before. I was there that year. Yeah, yeah, I was there. And it was like, you know, the most watched Disney, like whatever at that time, you know, maybe it's yeah. different now, but um, yeah. So it had a lot of hype going into it. Mm-hmm. And then I just think you had this, I feel very fortunate to work on projects where the characters aren't like the typical stereotypical characters for that genre. Mm-hmm. Uh, Marco is not your typical like Western animation male character. Mm-hmm. Like usually they're kind of like loud and bratty and they don't like girls. And it's like, you know, whatever, not Marco sensitive, loyal friend, good listener, like all these qualities that you're are like not toxic. He's mm-hmm. just like really, really good boy. Um, and then Star, not your typical Disney princess. She mm-hmm. was like, I don't want somebody to save me. I just want to do it myself. I want a friend to be there with me, but I don't need somebody to save me, which is not a common, you know, you don't see female more, characters. Becoming more common. Yeah, becoming more common, definitely. But yeah. in 2013, when the show was starting, yeah, and in 2015, when it came out, it was like, yeah, this is, it was like totally empowering on all sides. And I think that just resonated with the audience. Yeah. And, um... I think, I mean, it was sort of like, you know, there's so many different pieces to these puzzles. Um, I think it's a combination of actors. I think it's the writers. I think the fact that I I heard this and I don't know that it's, I need to ask Darren if it's 100% true, but I think she was like the kind of leader that a lot of people that she brought in for season one of Star got a a title shift upward Mm. for whatever their job was. Like, or if they wanted to do this, she just like. It was like a family. Like she it was, gave people the opportunity yes, to shine. Yes. So like on all level, it was just firing mm-hmm. on all cylinders. At mm-hmm. that time, um, uh, there's a guy named Julian. He runs the social media for Disney TVA and XD and channel and all. I think channel. But he was running the Disney XD social medias at that time, which is where Star was on. What's his name? Uh, Julian. Okay. Julian Gray. If we crossed yeah. paths, sounds familiar. Okay. Yeah. He's a great dude. Um, and he, he has said to me before, man, I like learned how to do so much on social media because of star. And I think that's because of the fan response and mm-hmm. how they, how engaged they were on social media and stuff like that. I mean, even to this day, you see like the ones who are like diehard holding out that maybe we'll get a movie or another season are like still commenting like <laughs> star related things on other posts. Um, can you do the voice for us? Yeah, I mean, Marco Diaz is pretty much like right here. He's, uh, you know, a little bit higher than my normal voice, but uh, he likes nachos. He's a safe kid. You know, oh, be careful. You know, I don't want to hurt your foot. <laughs> <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> yeah. That's great. Yeah, he's just such a, he's just such a good boy. I love, I love Marco. And my time on Star was amazing. So mm. Now you also have another big bucket list item, which is having a Star Wars show. Mm. So let's talk about your character, um, Ch- Lee Char. Yeah, Prince Lee Not Char. Not Char Lee, but Lee Char. Yes. Prince Lee Char in yes. Clone Wars. Yes. Uh, that was uh, a wild experience. Uh, that audition was completely secret. Like, I didn't know what I was auditioning Mm -hmm. for, which, you know, can happen with like video games and stuff like that. But it's not super common in animation. Um, And again, this was like really early on in sort of like my newfound opportunities with CESD. So I had just Mm -hmm. signed pretty recent, pretty like close to when I got that audition with CESD. Um, And which, by the way, as soon as I signed with them, I feel like it was a total career change. Like, I'm very grateful for CESD. Um, yeah. Uh, but I auditioned for this thing. Don't know what it is. And I get a call from Kathy Lizio over at CESD and she's like, Hey honey, you booked this thing. You got to go here on this day. And I was like, yeah, like, all right, cool. Thank you so much. Um, and so I go and, uh, I get there and it's again, one of my first bigger like things. Could you tell from the sides? No. What, you had no, no idea. Oh no, my gosh. No, couldn't wow. tell. It was like very secretive. And uh, so I get there and I walk in and there's not really anyone in the lobby. <laughs> um, and the re- I was like, hello? yeah, yeah. I was like, hello. hello? I sign in and the receptionist is like, oh, just take a seat. Um, someone will be out with you. 
So someone from production comes out and they're like walking, they're carrying a paper, you know, which in those days you didn't sign contracts electronically. You signed actual pieces of paper, which is crazy. Ah, yes. Um, with like a, you know, feather. Yeah. Oil, oh, like of whatever. course. In your own they, blood. They rode in on horseback <laughs> and were like, please, to your session. Uh, <laughs> Open uh, a vein. And- yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so this person from production comes out and she hands me a piece of paper. She's like, just hang tight. We'll be back in a few minutes. And I'm like, okay, so cool. So I like look at this piece of paper and it says, dear Mr. MacArthur, on behalf of George Lucas, we'd like to welcome you to the Star Wars family. And I was like, I'm, I'm going to be on Clone Wars. <sighs> I was like, I'm going to set this down right here. And I like got up and I walked outside. And I was like, mom, I can't tell you what I'm working on. I love you. Bye. And I like went back inside. <laughs> and so I walked in, I walked in, they like had me come back to the booth. Um, like D Bradley Baker was back there. Matt Lanner was back there. Uh, James Arnold Taylor was back there. Ashley wow. Eckstein, like just like everybody, wow. you know, um, Corey Burton was back there and it was, so cool it was just so cool dave filoni was the director Mm -hmm. um which you know if you're a fan of any of the star wars stuff these days like he's directing episodes of mandalorian and like doing all this cool cool stuff so i did my episode and i walked out and i was like thank you guys so much take care hope i'll see you again they're like uh you got two more episodes and i was like i got three episodes sweet and so it was just like another surprise on my way out yes so, um, and, and what does uh, Prince Lee Char sound like? Oh, man, this is not impressive. <laughs> Lee Char sounds pretty much just like me. <laughs> like Lee Char sounds like the Prince of Moncala, like a little bit higher, maybe. He's 16, so he kind of resonates right in here. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty much Yuji too. If you ask me later on to do Yuji's voice, <laughs> Yuji sounds just like me. That's great though. Yeah. You know, because it's, you know, I think the misconception sometimes is that you need to have a huge stable of characters or be a very unique character actor, like a Fred Tattish or a D. Bradley Baker to have a career. But plenty of people, you know, sit in or book mostly in one range and area Mm -hmm. that that it's really is about the acting. Yeah. 100 percent is about the acting. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So what was it like when you saw your first episodes for oh. Clone Wars start to air? Mm, pretty wild. I mean, people are like, oh, do you watch? Are you able to watch your own stuff? I think the, the I always get asked this, like, mm-hmm. do you watch the stuff that you're on? And I think that's because a lot of people don't. I, don't I think on camera actors, some of them, you know, there's always like that one guy that will, will never watch his work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, I want to watch. Yeah. yeah, I definitely want to watch. Um so, yeah, I like to like, I don't know, check in and make sure that I think I'm sounding good or that I think I'm like doing a good job or what I can improve on. I always kind of watch it with that with that sort of perspective. Um, but it's also just like fun um, for Clone Wars specifically. The first time I saw it was at the season four premiere party. Oh, wow. And uh, the first three. So my episodes were the first three episodes of season four. And they all take place underwater. So they had the premiere party at an aquarium in Long Beach. Amazing. And in all the like giant fish tanks, they had like these cutouts of all the Star Wars characters no. underwater and like their cool scuba tank, <gasps> like scuba gear and stuff like that. Ah! It, it was really, really cool. Um, and then we watched episode one and two, I think, in their 4D theater. So like anytime oh like a boat would like splash and go underwater, they were like spraying water at us and all that <gasps> stuff. It was really cool. Wow, that's amazing. Yeah. They like handed out lightsabers. You know? Oh my gosh. Back in the day wow. when we like did stuff in person, you know? Yeah, yeah. I vaguely, yeah. vaguely recall those days. I know. I think back to that and I'm like, that was really a unique. Yeah, I just keep getting to do these like super unique things. I that's have amazing. to just keep making sure people are aware. I am so thankful. Like I am, it will, it's not lost on me. The fact that like I got to go to, you know, the Long Beach Aquarium for a Star Wars premiere for a voice that I, you know, I'm in get handed lightsabers and like Chewbacca's walking around. Like, how cool is that? You know what though, Adam, it's great that you are such a wonderful person with such a generous personality oh, and thanks. you share so much good energy out there. So Thank it's you. always a pleasure to hear. Yay. Let's, of course we are. Yay. Thank you. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your martial arts experience because, cool. you know, Three time black belts that I don't even really know what that means, to mm-hmm. be honest, but it seems like a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I have. So besides acting, I've just always had a love for martial arts. Like I've always wanted to do martial arts. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so I, again, I begged my parents, uh, for a really long time to, uh, mm -hmm. I begged my parents for a really long time to put me in some kind of martial arts. And I finally got beat up in sixth grade. <laughs> and, uh, again, sort of just like timing wise, mm -hmm. my dad used to be a police officer and he had trained with this like legendary martial arts teacher in Northern California oh, wow. who opened up a school right down the street from my house. Like right when I was getting bullied and like beat up in school and stuff uh -huh. like that. So I got beat up pretty bad in sixth grade and, uh, some other like life stuff had happened. We had like a death in the family mm. and things like that. Um, just like not great stuff was happening and my parents were finally like well i mean it's right here and they knew the teacher that was the big thing is like my dad knew the teacher and like spoke really highly of him um so they enrolled me in class um and that school taught kung fu and judo my teacher john yi was from china had uh come over here in the early 60s and had been teaching for a really long time i think i started in 1994 doing mm -hmm. martial arts and uh, he taught Kung Fu. And when he came over here from China, he started doing Judo, which is a Japanese martial art. Okay. But that was sort of during this time when like the Japanese martial arts and the Chinese martial arts, there was like, you know, they didn't really like each other. There's lots of rivalries. So he was very forward thinking. It's like Cobra Kai, dojo, yeah, like totally. dojo versus dojo. I mean, look, dojo. all these stories come from something. And it yeah. is this time of like martial arts history. I'm a total nerd for this stuff. Like Ooh. martial arts history is like so interesting to me. But uh, he kind of was forward thinking and didn't want to have this. So he started learning judo. So the school that I grew up in taught Kung Fu, judo, and then Tai Chi, which is like, you know, mm -hmm. a little slower movie. Um, so I started with Kung Fu. He told my parents I was too little and I was too weak. So <laughs> he wanted me to do judo also. So he put me in judo. And then, uh, yeah, from there, I just like did it all of the time. Wow. Um, I mean, I was at... I was at the Kung Fu school probably like six days a week. Wow. For four hours a night sometimes. Um, I mean, I did theater in high school and I played baseball and soccer until high school. So like I was like, I would get out of school. I would go to soccer practice. Then I'd go right to Kung Fu. I'd stay or I'd go right to judo. Then I'd stay for Kung Fu. And then I'd go home and do my homework and go to sleep and do it all again the next day. And like just continue to do that. Wow. So yeah, I competed really heavily. I got my... Uh, you know, in Kung Fu, there are sashes. So it's like a belt, but it's their turn, their grading system. So I have my red and black sash in traditional Northern and Southern Shaolin Kung Fu. Wow. I have my black belt in Judo. And then I have a black belt in Wushu. Wushu was the, my third. It's the one I came to the latest. Oh. And it's, uh, Wushu is like, have you heard of it? Mm -mm. It is, it's like picture of gymnastics floor routine, <gasps> Ooh. but martial arts. I think I want to do Wushu. You should do Wushu. It's really cool. Yeah. It's like, it's basically like what you see in the movies also okay. kind of like more like aesthetic over application. Uh huh. Uh -huh. So you're not like learning Wushu to go fight somebody or protect yourself. You're learning it to like look Perform. cool. And like, yeah, form. Wow. Um, do you feel yeah. that learning so much martial arts um, help influence the way you work as an actor? Yeah, totally. I mean, I am a very goal oriented person. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that comes from martial arts because it's yeah. like next year, next year, next year, which I think um, can be really beneficial as an actor. But I also think it can be detrimental <laughs> because there's not really like a linear. And you know, so much is out of our control. <laughs> totally, totally. But what it's what it has helped me with is um, self-belief, mm. um, confidence and Something that I always say is like being comfortable in the uncomfortable, mm. which I think is like invaluable for an actor. Mm. Um, like speaking back to when we were talking about like, you know, the peaks and valleys, like when you're in those valleys, sometimes it's really uncomfortable. And if you can be okay and just know that it's not your forever and that you're going to come out of that, mm. then, you know, you're going to be okay and you'll be, you'll be able to keep going, you know? And so, yeah. So I think martial arts really like, instilled that in me and made it so that uh i was able i'm able to like persevere even when it's tough or you know you can't see what's next yeah 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 amazing yeah. my my teacher always said to me uh and he said in relation to martial arts but when i left home he had a talk with me and he said something to me um he said someone has to go get those parts those roles those jobs mm -hmm. it might as well be you and i was like what a, what a like simple thing, like a simple thought. Right. But, uh, I don't know. Yeah. Like it might as well be me. 
I'm not saying that in any kind of cocky me. way. Yeah, yeah. It might <laughs> as well. It might, everything you audition for, it might as well be you. The, the whole point of like, yeah. someone has to get it. Yeah. So, and you're reading, as long as you're, you know, working your way up so that you can get yourself opportunities, mm -hmm. then there's no reason it can't be you. So you just have to go in there and know that at some point it will be you. I feel like yeah. Cheers. we need you to do cheers? it one more time. Yes. Adam, yes. it has been such a pleasure to have you on the show awesome. and get to chat with you yeah. and hear about everything that you have going on. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Yeah, of course. Thanks for we having me. We appreciate it. Of course. Um, thanks for watching, you guys. I hope that you subscribe or share this with a friend if you would like to hear more. And if there are other guests you would like to see, go ahead and drop them in the comments. See you next week. Bye. Bye.